Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dan Murphy. I'm executive director of the Masavur Romani Center for Business and Government. And I'm very pleased today to introduce our speaker, speaker Rodrigo Vargara, who is a research fellow with us. As many here will know, in October 2019, there was a modest fare increase on the metro, which tapped into uh, some feelings of social and political dissatisfaction in Chile and sparked unrest, which has resulted in a movement to rewrite the, con the constitution in Chile. So we have the perfect speaker to talk about that topic today. Rodrigo Vergara was governor of the Central Bank of Chile between 2011 and 2016. Between 2009 and 2011, he was member of the policy board of the Central Bank of Chile. Mr. Vergara graduated in economics from Universidad Católica de Chile in 1985. And I'm proud to note that he earned his PhD in economics here at Harvard in 1991. Between 1985 and 1995, he worked at the Central Bank of Chile, rising to the position of chief economist in 1992. He's worked at various think tanks and was also a full professor at the economics department of Universidad de Católica. He's also been an economic advisor to the central banks and governments of several countries in Latin America, Eastern Europe, Asia, and Africa. Uh, I could spend the next 15 minutes going over your other illustrious professional and academic accomplishments, but that would take away time from hearing your views on this important topic, Chile at the crossroads, the coming constitutional and political changes. The floor is yours. Welcome and thank you. There's someone. Okay, now is it working? No? Yeah, it is. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Dan, for that kind uh, introduction. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me to, to, to give this, this talk here at, at HKS. Uh, so uh, I'm going to talk about. Chile at a crossroads, the coming constitutional and political changes. I know many of you are from Chile, so I'm not going to be very innovative to, to many of you, but some of you uh, are from other countries, and that this is, I think, an interesting case to look at, the case of Chile. So let me start with a brief overview of, of, uh, of, of Chile, and in particular of the Chilean economy. During the last three decades, Chile has been the sort of poster child of Latin America. A stable country, solid institutions, a bit boring, um, with, uh, with uh, low inflation, uh, 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 an independent and prestigious central bank, uh, low budget deficits, low public debt. We even managed to build uh, sovereign wealth funds during the first uh, decade of the 2000s during the commodity super cycle, um, high growth, Chile became the country with the highest or one of the two countries with the highest per capita income in the region. It still has that place. It's, if you take almost any index, World Bank, uh, World Economic Forum, etc., Chile appears at the top of the list uh, of Latin American countries. But not only that, a massive reduction in poverty, an improvement of most social indicators, and also a decrease in income inequality. I'm going to show you some numbers. Uh, I'm giving now a, a brief introduction. Uh, that was the case, uh, such as that President Piñera, uh, a week before the social outbreak, uh, gave an interview to an international newspaper and said that Chile was an oasis in this region. That uh, Chile was uh, very stable, very calm as compared to almost any other Latin American economies. And he mentioned in that interview Mexico, Brazil, Argentina, Ecuador, and others. Uh, but then, as Dan was mentioning, on October 18th, 
2019, so that's two years ago, we saw a massive and very violent social outbreak. Protests, the burning of several metro stations, burning of uh, buses from the public transportation system, uh, burning of churches, uh, looting of shops, small shops, and also large supermarkets. In general, very violent protests. And that remained for a while, for some days and for some weeks. And uh, of course, with each time with less intensity, but still very violent, uh, until the political system got an agreement to write a new constitution. The agreement was called the Agreement for Peace and a New Constitution, to give a way to this. I'm gonna talk about the constitution and why it was the, a way to give, uh, 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 to give, uh, some some come to the to, to to what was going on in, in the country. But what were the protesters asking for? Basically change. And what change it was not very clear at the beginning, but I would say more equality, okay? Social justice, moving into that direction. Uh, I'm gonna talk a bit more about that uh, later on. Uh, the thing is this now, uh, so the country is now in a process of writing a new constitution. Uh, there, was, there was a referendum in which 78 of the country voted for the new constitution. Then there were elections of the constitution convention members. They are already at this moment working in the new constitution. It is supposed to be ready by the end or in July next year, and then it's gonna be subject to a new referendum to see whether the population approves or rejects this new constitution. Um, but also, there have been a lot of changes in the political map of Chile. The two, the two coalitions that have dominated in Chilean politics during the last three decades, during these decades of progress, and uh, in which Chile has been an outstanding uh, performer, I would say, uh, are being overcome by new coalitions. These two coalitions are basically the central right and the central left. The central left has been in, in power about 75% of the time during the last three decades, and the central right about 25% of the time. We have elections, presidential elections, in a couple of weeks. And, and polls show that the two leading candidates are from the far right and from the far left. So uh, the population has moved towards the extremes. So what, what, what is the point here? What is happening? Uh, Chile probably will have to decide during the next year or two, how conducts this process. And there are basically two ways, two roads here. This is why I call this Chile at a crossroad. The first one is to make the changes that have to be made. In fact, there are many changes that have to be made and make them in a peaceful way, probably in a gradual way, and some way or another resume this path of growth. Growth, but in a more inclusive way. The second one is to basically become yet another case of frustrated development in Latin America, which is the way of populism, uh, the way, of, the, the way that, that of bad public policies. And let's be clear, that's the way that is chosen, has been chosen in the previous decades by many Latin American countries, so this wouldn't be a big surprise. In abstract, it seems that the answer to this question is clear. Well, we should take the right way not the wrong way, but in practice, it's much more difficult than that. Because in turbulent political and social times, it's many times easier to go for the populist way. Uh, so that's what I, I wanna I talk in more detail uh, now. The issues I'm gonna touch on are basically, first I'm gonna talk about some background, I'm gonna, mention and show you some social and economic indicators. Then the social unrest, uh, the outbreak of October 19, uh, 2019, I'm sorry, uh, some hypothesis why this happened in this environment. Then I'm gonna touch 
uh, briefly on the political environment and then on the constitutional debate. And finally, some conclusions. This is, does this have a, no? okay, this is uh, GDP, Chile and the rest of uh, and the world. Okay, uh, so this is world GDP since 1985, and this is Chilean GDP since 1985. And while world GDP has increased by 3.4 times, Chilean GDP has increased by more than five times. Okay, has increased by a multiple of more than five times. This sort of demonstrates what has been the Chilean economic growth and why it is, uh, it is, uh, seen as a poster child, as I said at the beginning, for Latin America. Uh, the difference is bigger here than more recently. Let's see that in the next slide. This is growth during the period 85, 97. Chile grew at a rate of about 7% during this period, while the world grew at 3.5%. So growth in Chile was twice as much as growth in the world. This is called, by the way, the golden age of, Chilean, of the Chilean economy. Then, in the next uh, 12 to 15 years, Chile grew at more than 4% above the world, but slightly above the world, which is more or less understandable if we think of convergence. Okay? The country became richer, so it was natural to grow at a lower rate, though the decline was very abrupt. Now, in the last six years, growth has been uh, quite poor. Chile has grown less than the world. Okay? And that, I'm going to argue in a minute, that in part explains part of the problems that we have had during this last couple of years. Growth has been very mediocre, okay? uh, much lower than what it used to be in the last year. So, here we were a shining star. The, the star here uh, was fading. This is per capita GDP as percentage of US GDP. While in 1985, we had a per capita GDP of about 21% of the US GDP, it went up to more than 40%, and now it's about 38, 39%. Okay, so again, a huge increase here, and then some stagnation in the last few years. The same if you see total factor productivity. Big increases until 2013, 14, and then some stagnation and even some decline. What has happened with inflation? Really, it's been a very successful uh, experience. We had an inflation rate of between 20 and 30% during the 1980s. In 1990, uh, an independent central bank was established with inflation targets. The targets are these shadow green areas here, uh, and inflation went down from 25% to 3% in 2000. Since then, a target of 3% was established with a tolerance range of plus minus 1%, so between 2 and 4%. Most of the time, inflation has been there, but the most important thing is that on average, inflation has been 3%, 3.1% during this period. So the target is 3, the actual inflation has been on average, 3.1%. And that's one of the reasons why the credibility of the central bank is so high. This is public debt. We saw a huge decline of public debt during the first uh, 16 to 17 years after the return of democracy. Uh, but then we've seen an increase in debt. The level of debt is not that large, actually it's relatively small as compared to many countries. But what is a concern here is the slope of this increase. Okay. Uh, so again, as in, as in growth, we, we were very responsible in fiscal terms, but this is changing a little bit okay, in the last several years. Now, this can be explained the first part because of a global financial crisis, this because of the pandemic, but then we have this period here in which things were normal and still dead started to increase. Again, the debt is low in relative standards, but it's been increasing at very high rates. What is more impressive, probably, is what has happened with poverty. 
This is the poverty rate as a percentage of population. It went down from 70% or 60 something percent in 1990 to about 10% nowadays. It increased a little bit during the pandemic, probably in 2021, it will show a, a decrease. Uh, and extreme poverty went down from 50% to 4%. So it was very impressive. Finally, and um, very interestingly, I'm going to show another couple of slides with this, but, but the Gini index, and as you all know, measure incomes inequality, and this is World Bank data, went down from 50, 55, 56 to 44 uh, during this period. So there was also an improvement in terms of income inequality. Inequality declined during this period. Now, let's be clear. By the way, if you want to interrupt me, please do interrupt me. If you have any questions, please just raise your hand and, and ask, ask, ask the question. Uh, so uh, we saw this uh, decline in inequality. However, this is still a relatively large figure. Uh, Latin America is one of the most uneven countries in the world, uneven regions in the world. And most of the developed countries have a Gini index of 0.3. Uh, the US is about 0.4, Chile is 0.44, okay? The lowest in Latin America is Uruguay that has something like 0.4. Another social indicator, life expectancy and birth, it went from 60, 50 something years in 1960 to more than 80 years now. It's above the US, okay? Uh, so, uh, and finally, I wanna show this school enrollment. Uh, again, this is World Bank data. It, uh, tertiary or higher education went from 10% to uh, close to 90% during the last uh, the last uh, many years, actually, 20, in the last 30 years, from 20% to about 90%. So there was, all this period was a period of huge economic success and improvements in uh, social indicators. There was also a process of immigration, still had and uh, uh, immigration population, which was about 1% of the total population. And during the last 10 years or 15 years, it went from that level to about 8% of the total population. And this immigration is explained, I edited a book recently on this matter, basically by two factors. First, the economy was doing well. So people came to, take, to Chile to find a, a better uh, uh, living standard, but also because of the crisis, both in Venezuela and Haiti. So Chile received many immigrants from those two countries. In summary, Chile has been a success story in the last 30 years, at least in many aspects. I'm going to mention some aspects in which it has not, but at least in many aspects, it's been a success story in the last 30 years. High growth, reduction in poverty, and income inequality. In other words, as President Piñera said in his interview, an oasis. But then, in October 2019, we saw this. This is a metro station being destroyed. These are people manifesting violently and throwing, uh, throwing uh, stones to the police and making fires here. This is a metro station completely destroyed. This is a bus being burned. Etc. Okay, but also not only violent protests. Uh, we saw a massive peaceful demonstration. This is uh, those of you that are from Chile know what this picture is. This is uh, a demonstration, a peaceful demonstration uh, in Santiago on October 25th, so one week after the outbreak, in which a million people went on the streets and demonstrated peacefully and asked basically for change. Okay. Um, so, what went wrong? Why this happened? Why we didn't see this coming? Uh, why in a context of a country that's been successful in many aspects, we see this type of 
unrest. Uh, why people want change if things are working well? Well, probably things are not working that well. Uh -huh. Here I have some explanation. I don't pretend to have the explanation. I don't think that there is the explanation. I think that this is going to be probably a matter of study for many years to come. First, we have the issue of income distribution. It is true, income distribution was improving, but it's still a very, it is still very unequal. Okay, so that explains part of the problem. On the extreme, very rich segment of the population, but majority of the population with relatively low income. But I think that it goes beyond that. We should think of inequality in a broader terms. Basically, inequality in terms of access to social services. Here, I want to make three examples. First, health. As many of you know, in Chile, we have sort of a dual health system. On the one hand, you have a private system that works very well. It's very efficient. Uh, if you are ill and need a surgery, you will get the surgery rapidly uh, whenever you want, and uh, a, a great service. But then you have 85% of the population that goes to a public system. That, by the way, it has improved, but it's definitely well, well below, below the private system. And the basic problem there are the waiting lists. People, if you if you have an, an, an if you're ill and you need, for instance, a surgery, you might have to wait for a year or more to get to get uh, your your surgery. Uh, sometimes people die waiting to be to, 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 to be uh, provided with this with the service that they want. So we there have a problem. Okay, education is also a problem in this sense. And I want to mention one specific issue here. As we saw before, the access to higher education increased and increased quite significantly over the last many years. So. Most of the students in higher education in Chile now are the first members of the family going to the university, going to college. And they expected that this would change their lives. They would have, you know, a much higher salary when they graduate, that they would be able to help their families uh, because of this these uh, new educations that we, they were getting. Uh, nonetheless, uh, that didn't happen. This is a typical case of frustrated expectations. Universities, new, new universities were not of high quality, first. And second, when this guy graduated, they got salaries that were just, let's say, 10 or 15% above what they would have got, got if they had not gone to, to uh, universities or to professional institutions. Uh, on the other hand, they had to ask for student loans. So they went out, went out of college with a debt, it's a big burden, and without earning as much as they expected to earn, without having uh, all the opportunities they thought they would have. So there is another issue that uh, also as is affecting, you know, the Chilean population, at least most of the population. And finally, we have the issue, and many others, of course, of social security. We have a social security system that has been mentioned and admired in many countries of the world, but it has a problem, which is not a minor problem. The tensions are low because the replacement rate is low. The replacement rate is the, as you all know, the pension divided by a percentage of your last uh, uh, salary of the last 10 years average salary. And it's relatively low. And why it is low? I mean, it, this is a capitalization system. This is a private system. You basically save or contribute to a private institution, IFPs, AFPs, and they manage your resources, and then at the end of your working life, you get your pension. Uh, uh, these private institutions are blamed for all problems of the pension system in Chile. My view is that they are not responsible for the problem. The problem is more political. First, and most importantly, 
there are a significant amount of the population that does not contribute to the system. And why? Because they are informal. Chile is the country with the, with the smallest uh, informal labor force in Latin America, but it's still high, 25%. And those people do not contribute to the social security system. So they don't get pensions. So when you do averages, they get a very small replacement rate, uh, close to zero, actually. Okay. So other people that are formal, that work the whole life, get 70 or 80% replacement rate, but on average, they are low. There's a significant portion of the population that are not getting pensions, or high enough pensions. Second, uh, the contribution rate is low. The contribution rate in Chile is only 10%. The, the, the average contribution rate in OECD economies is about 16%. If you think of that, if we move from 10 to 18% in steady state, pensions would increase by 60%. Okay. And third, the age of retirement is low, and the, there is a political problem there, but because nobody wants to increase the age of retirement, because this is very unpopular from a political point of view. Uh, all these issues could have been addressed by the political system, but they were not addressed by the political system. So they were, this was a pressure uh, building up, and finally it exploded. Uh, then there's also this argument of abuses privileges. This is the usual argument that there's an elite that has a lot of privileges, that can access many services, that is wealthy, and the vast majority of the population is uh, in a completely different situation. This elite really doesn't abide to the rules that apply to everyone, to, to everybody else, uh, and, and they uh, get away with uh, many things that most people can't, uh, most people have to face. Then I think there is this issue of new generation, new paradigm. Uh, the, the new generation didn't see you, <laughs> didn't see the big improvements in, in the in Chilean standards of living. So in, in a way, they don't value that very much. Uh, when you talk to you know many uh, young people from the suburbs of Santiago, uh, you can argue with them. You say, look, look at how has progress this, this, this country. I mean, you now have, or you can afford a car, uh, you can work in a, in a, in, in, in a good job, uh, you can afford many things that your parents couldn't afford. And they would tell you, I don't care. I mean, I am here, I am in this situation, so I um, can, aspire, can, can, uh, can aspire to much more than what my parents did. So I don't care what happened in the past. I care what's coming in the future. Uh, there's a low trust in institutions. I think that's probably a global problem. Um, it's especially critical in the case of Latin America. Most institutions have a very low degree of trust and basically political institutions. Um, so that has uh, reduced uh, the, 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 the in, in a sense, uh, political institutions have been very much affected by this. Uh, there's the declining growth rates that's the whole, that has also affected. When the economy is growing at 7% or even at 5%, there are enough additional resources to distribute to people. Everyone gets a job. Wages increase. The economy is doing fine. When the economy grows at 2%, things are different. There's not enough for everybody. So that also affected. And finally, it is very important to say that this, this is not a Chilean phenomenon only. This is a more global phenomenon. Actually, at the same time that this was happening in Chile, we had unrest in Bolivia, in Ecuador, in Colombia, in France, Hong Kong, for other reasons, of course, and Catalonia, also for other reasons, basically the independence uh, movement there. But there were social outbreaks, social unrest in many parts of the world. This has been a sort of a common modern phenomenon. So where's Chile now? Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, most political parties 
with the exception of the very far left, the Communist Party, signed an agreement for peace and a new constitution. So a new constitution, I mentioned this already, is being, at this moment, written. Now, what is the problem with the old constitution, with the current constitution of Chile? Uh, is there a big problem with the constitution? Um, the, the constitution is the constitution of 1980 that was written during the dictatorship. But it's been reformed many times. Actually, it has the signature of President Lagos, a socialist. Uh, and many people argue that there are many things that you cannot do in, the, in, the, in, the, in these constitutions. Basically, that has a, uh, a privileged role for the private sector and that the state cannot intervene in many areas. I've studied the constitution. Actually, I wrote a book on the constitution. I, I don't think that that's really the problem. If, if that were the problem, you can change the constitution. You can modify the constitution. You don't have to change the whole constitution. I think there was a problem, there was a problem of legitimacy. This constitution was written during a dictatorship. It was, it was never to be accepted by a significant majority of the population. And that's the reason why, finally, all political parties decided to change the constitution. And so we're going to have a new constitution that's going to define probably the path of Chile for the next 30 to 40 years. Uh, there is polarization uh, in the political system. The extremes are gaining traction. Uh, the electoral system doesn't help. We had a, previously a majority electoral system with many problems. It was changed for a proportional system, but this has produce a lot of fragmentation in the Chilean political spectrum. So at the end, it's very difficult to govern because it's very difficult to form majority coalitions. I expect that this changes during the constitutional discussion. Also, bad public policies in this turbulent uh, environment with social unrest, we're being subject to pretty bad public policies that have affected growth and will affect growth in the future. I don't have time to go into them, but that's been the case. And also this, this tendency to start from scratch. Chile, Chile had been a very stable country, moving gradually uh, over time. And now there's this tendency of many to say that everything was wrong in the past, so we have to change everything. We have to change from zero. Uh, and that's, of course, it's a major problem. So what is the challenge? To keep the good things and change what is to be improved. And of course, there are things to have, have to have, to, uh, there are things that have to be improved. But there are also things that are okay. So the real challenge is to find the equilibrium between these two forces. And this is easier to think and to do. Uh, in a turbulent political, social, and economic environment, this has become very difficult. Uh, and also in a in a situation with, with, with the pandemic. I don't have to talk about the pandemic, uh, but, uh, but also, of course, it's, it's, it has affected. What were the results in the Constitutional Convention? Basically this, um, this was a, an election with gender parity and with representatives of native population. Uh, the government, so this is the center right, got 24% of the, of the representatives. The center left, 16% of the representatives. So between the center right and the center left, they got 40% of the, of the representatives. You have to remember that these were the two major political forces during the last three decades. The far left got 33% of the representatives. Here is um, the Frente Ampli and the Communist Party. Independent, 15% and representatives of native population, 11%, uh, that uh, basically that was the design to give them this proportion of the convention. Um, so there's this tendency towards the, the towards uh, basically this blank slate that I was mentioning before. I mean, let's change everything. My view is that's probably with time, there will be moderation within the convention, and we will end up with a, hopefully, with something uh, reasonable. But there's a big challenge there. So where's Chile now? I'm showing you these two 
press articles. This is the last issue of The Economist, uh, the one that came out last uh, Thursday. Actually, today is coming out the new one, but this is the, the last one. And basically, and has a, a, an article on Chile that says Chile wants to consider Latin America's Finland is in trouble uh, with this picture here. Uh, I think that this is an exaggeration to say that Chile was like Finland. <laughs> we were never like Finland. I mean, to be clear, but we were a stable country, and it says here we're in trouble. A constitutional convention formed by to battle populism looks unlikely to help. I look at the first uh, phrase here. He, 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 they are quoting a, a, a person, a woman, who want to see the end of capitalism and neoliberalism. Okay, uh, and there is also a, a statement uh, in the middle of this article that says. Chile looks in worse shape than at any point since the return of democracy three decades ago. So it's sort of, I would say, pessimistic regarding what can happen in the country. And this is uh, an article by the, um, by the newspaper El País. This is El País of Uruguay. Uh, talks about the Chilean tragedy. And basically says uh, it is a tragedy that a country that has achieved so much decides to change everything. Okay? Why? not change what, what is wrong, what it has to be changed. And, and, uh, and basically also talks about not recognizing what was achieved in the past. Uh, so what are the major challenges uh, regarding the, uh, what are the major challenges regarding the constitution? What are the issues that are gonna be discussed? Everything is at stake here. Everything can change, okay? Uh, so they're gonna be discussed almost everything not almost everything. Uh, but I, I would like to mention just a couple of things here. I already mentioned the electoral system. It has to be changed in my view, uh, uh, because it, to have a proportional system it makes things very difficult uh, for, for, for having a good government. Um, but there's a big discussion now on the system of government. Are we gonna keep the presidential system that we have now, or we're we gonna move towards a parliamentary system? I would say, of course, I don't know what's going to happen, but I would say that if you see the statements of most of the members of the convention, we're probably going to move away from the presidential system and more towards a parliamentary system. Probably not all the way through a parliamentary system, but a semi-presidential system like the French one, uh, we're going to have that type of system. Um, the argument here is that it would make government or policy decisions easier in the sense that when you have a parliamentary system, the uh, executive and the, and the parliament are the same. Okay? Uh, that's gonna be a big discussion. There's a, uh, there are opposite views here. Some people want to maintain the presidential system. After all, during Chile's history, there's never been a parliamentary system. There are some argument that during 30 years between 1918 18, and 1925, there was a parliamentary system, but it was not really a parliamentary system, okay? So it's always been a presidential system of government. And that's gonna be one of the major discussion in this, in this, uh, in this uh, constitution. And then we have the economy, right? Again, everything's gonna be discussed here. So it's not only uh, the, the system of government, of the electoral system, it's gonna be everything. But uh, regarding the economy, these are some of the issues that are gonna be discussed. This is a book that I just uh, uh, wrote, edited with uh, Rodrigo Valdez, who's former Minister of Finance of Chile, uh, on different aspects of, economic aspects of the constitution. What are some of the aspects that are gonna be discussed? First, the independence of the central bank. Um, I hope that the independence of the central bank will be maintained. I am relatively optimistic on this. I don't think that it will change. Central bank has been very successful in terms of inflation, which is its mandate. But there's gonna be discussion on some issues regarding the central bank. First, should it be in the constitution or not? In some countries it's in the constitution, in some countries it's not in the constitution. Uh, second, the mandate. Is it gonna have a single mandate as it is now, basically inflation or price stability? Or should it have a dual mandate? 
like it is the case here in the US with the Federal Reserve. Inflation plus employment. There's gonna be some discussion of, on, on those. I don't think that this is, any of those two issues are, re are really critical uh, in the sense that if we change somewhat those issues, I would rather not change them, but nothing, uh, I don't think that that would jeopardize the independence of the central bank. This is the third issue, issue which I think is more important and more critical, which is the way to remove the board members of the bank. Uh, there are many people that are proposing that board members are subject to political accusations or political impeachment. In that sense, uh, why I think that this is, is more complicated because if you are at the central bank and you have to make a unpopular policy, say raise high rates, high interest rates, and uh, uh, you know that if you do so, you can have an, an, an accusation from parliament, an impeachment process, you know that would definitely might have an impact on your independence. There's gonna be discussed fiscal policy here. Uh, well, there are many issues that uh, are in the constitution, mostly the uh, uh, exclusive initiative of the president to propose projects that imply increases in taxes, in, I'm sorry, changes in taxes or changes in government spending. Uh, the basic view here has been to give more power to Congress. Um, decentralization, social rights, this is gonna be a big discussion on social rights. What social rights should be in the constitution? But more important than that, I would say, is the issue of how to finance those social rights. I hope that the two things go together, okay? Because if not, we can have the usual or the typical Latin American constitution where you have many tens of social rights, but they are not, they cannot be funded, okay? Uh, because there's not, the budget constraint just doesn't allow you to, to, to fund all these rights. Um, that's a problem because the, then the constitution loses legitimacy. Um, the role of the state, as I was mentioning to you at the beginning, uh, uh, some people want to give a bigger role to the state. Oh, at least uh, uh, this, this discussion whether the, the current constitution is very restricted regarding the role of the state. Property rights, and in particular, uh, natural resources and water. There's gonna be a big discussion on what happens with water. Water in this, at this moment in, in Chile is, uh, currently in Chile is, is private. We have a system like, a, uh, uh, like the Australian uh, system where basically the state concessions water rights and then uh, you can uh, trade them uh, in the market. And there's a, you know, a big movement against this. So there's gonna be probably a movement towards the nationalization of, of the water resources. Uh, and also it's a discussion on, on mining. So let me give you my final thought here. Uh, the next couple of years are gonna determine what's gonna happen in Chile for the next two or three or four or five decades. Uh, what are the crossroads? That's why this is the title that I put to this talk. Um, on the one hand, we can make the changes that we have to make in a peaceful, gradual manner, and to have a more inclusive society, which is something that is needed. And uh, if that is the case, we might resume the path of dynamism and growth of the economy and eventually become the first Latin American country to be a developed country. But there's also the wrong way. What happens if finally, if finally the forces of populism prevail, as it was said in the article of The Economist? Uh, what happens if, that hap if, if, if populism prevails and we end up in a situation with bad public policies, then we will have stagnation, uh, probably more inflation, capital outflows, budget deficits, and all the usual uh, aspects that have most 
Latin American economies or that have had most Latin American economies over the last many decades. Uh, this is not, what are the odds here? It's not easy to say exactly what are the odds. At the beginning, I was relatively optimistic regarding this, but as long as the discussion has evolved, as the debate, debate has shown some of the different positions, a bit less optimistic, I would say 50-50, which is still relatively optimistic, I would say, for the case of Chile. There is the chance that we take the wrong way, and I hope we don't. Uh, my view uh, is that now, as I mentioned, it's about 50-50. Uh, uh, I talked to many of the members of the Constitutional Assembly, and they, uh, they seem very reasonable, but there are forces within the Assembly that uh, try to move uh, the country th towards the extremes. So I think I will finish there. Uh, if you have questions, please raise your hand. Thank you for this uh, great presentation. I am curious about uh, the model in which uh, central bank members are subject to impeachment. Are there any good benchmarks of examples in which that kind of a model has turned out well or not in other parts of the world? I've seen many experiences. I've never seen something such as that. Um, so I, no. The answer to that is no, there are no good examples on that. Um, I see mostly uh, the, the developed world. And actually you don't see, uh, when you think of, of the independence of the central bank or of any institution, what is the key to independence? Well, first that it has a clear mandate and it, that it has the instruments to meet that mandate. But it's also very important um, the way that the, members of that institutions can be removed. Okay? If you can be easily removed, then the institution is not independent. I remember that here in the US there was this discussion uh, when, when Trump wanted to remove uh, Jay Powell, uh, and of course he couldn't. Uh, uh, and actually there is a way to remove, but, but it has to meet a lot of conditions. So it's, not, it's, it's never happened. Now, if you make it easier and you make it political, then things, uh, might turn up pretty bad. Hi, Rodrigo. Thank you for the great talk. So, um, you you mentioned that you think that uh, changing the constitution likely is not going to fix the root causes of some of Chile's issues. You mentioned income inequality, you know, the privileges or high informality and so on. I'm curious as to what. I think is what what is your hypothesis for why it was so hard for the country to maybe change these issues? This is just that it was a technical big challenge to you know create more social progress. Was it state capacity? Was it maybe lack of awareness of the elites or vested interests? Because it seems like the, if if changing the constitution was not really the constraint, it seems like the country is eventually going to run into another wall very soon. So I'm curious as to what's what are your hypotheses of what really needs to change for Chile to fix those remaining issues. My view is this, um, changes in the constitution can help, but of course a new constitution will not do miracles. Uh, it's, it's a constitution. Uh, I, my view is that most of the things that need to be changed could have been made without a new, a whole new constitution. Um, that's from a technical point of view. Now, from a political point of view, I also said that I think that there, there was a problem of legitimacy. So uh, probably to bring social peace, you needed to have a new constitution. Uh, this was always going to be the constitution of the dictatorship of Pinochet. Even if you made a lot of reforms to, the, to it. Um, so uh, the constitution can help. Um, for instance, there are things in, in terms of the health system that the current constitution doesn't allow and the new constitution would allow. Um, 
but again, you could have made changes to, 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 to the current constitution uh, if that would bring social peace. But I don't think it would have bring, brought social peace. So I, at the end, I think that it was more or less inevitable at some point to change the constitution. Um, and what I just want to say is that it is an important process. It was a way out of the major problems uh, or, or, or the unrest that we had in the, in the past. But on the other hand, if we don't uh, have good public policies, if growth does not resume, I've got the impression that we're gonna hit a wall again, as you, as you said. Uh, so it goes well beyond the constitution, the problems that Chile has nowadays. Um, I don't know whether that answers your question, but, uh, but uh, uh, I guess it is, not that I, it is not that I think that it was, that we could have done it uh, or that, that, that the change of constitution doesn't, doesn't get anything. No, I think it would get, you know, a, a sort of a, we will, it will overcome this problem of legitimacy. Uh, it will produce some sort of social peace but it will not do miracles uh, if public policies don't improve, if growth of the economy is, is, remains stagnated, then definitely we were not gonna satisfy the expectations of the, of the people. And probably we, if that is the case, we're gonna hit another wall and we're gonna, I mean, populist policies are gonna prevail and uh, well, we're gonna be uh, like most of other Latin American economies and like we were in the past, a mediocre economy. Uh, thanks for, for the presentation, Professor. I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on how the presidential elections we're having soon in, in Chile can affect the outcomes or maybe the, the feedback loops between the presidential elections and the discussions at the Constitutional Assembly? That's a very good, that, that, that's a very good question. And we really don't know. Um, um, but uh, they would probably have an effect. Uh, if the far left candidate wins, the constitution is basically dominated by the, by, by the left. Uh, Probably there won't be major changes. Uh, as you all know, I mean, you, you, the, 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 the new constitution can, constitution can change the term of the next government, okay? Uh, uh, so if the, the candidate from the left wins, probably that's not gonna happen. Now we don't know what happens, what will happen if the candidate from the right wins. Uh, in that case, there might be the temptation to change the term of the next president. If that happens, I would think that that would be a mistake because that would produce a big uh, you know, unrest uh, and a discussion within the country. But we, yeah, we're gonna have, uh, we're gonna have, those things are gonna be linked at least. I think we have time for one more question. Okay. Hello, uh, thanks Rodrigo for the talk. I, I have a question about legitimacy that you, you were mentioning. Why now? I mean, if the, the, the constitution has not the backup of, of the people, why, the, why is now happening? And why didn't it happen before when the government had probably more uh, power or more capacity to do it in a less violent way? In a peaceful way, yeah. Uh, that, that's a very good question. and. Uh... Probably that applies to almost everything. Uh -huh. Why now? I mean, we knew that we had to change the pension system. Why we didn't change it before? We know that we have to make some changes to the health, public health system, or the health system in general terms. Why we didn't do that before? I think that we made mistakes uh, here that uh, we didn't foresee what was coming. Uh, so we postponed changes. Um, and the same happened with the constitution. If you, if you think President Bachelet 
a week before she left the government, left a new constitution and uh, introduced a bill for a new constitution in Congress. Um, I think that most of the people that has opposed to a new constitution probably would be happy to go for the Bachelet constitution now. Uh, because at the end, what happens with you, when you delay things, definitely you end up with probably a worse outcome than what you would have gotten if you had done it earlier. So, uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, there were many mistakes done, in, and, and probably those mistakes explain, at least in part, what, what has been going on in the country in the, last, uh, in the last couple of years. Rodrigo, thank you very much. One, one of the questions I had coming into this event was, it seemed to me that the main um, source of unrest was political and social participation. And the logical conclusion of that to me was not to address the Constitution, but it seems you've pointed out that that was really a reaction against the Constitution that was approved under the dictatorship. Um, I'm just curious, for, for those who are, who are protesting or feel strongly about rewriting the Constitution, I haven't heard people say that they prefer one system of government to another, a parliamentary system or, or a presidential system. Is that aligned with what you're seeing and hearing? Absolutely. I mean, this is this is a discussion which that is only within the, the, the Constitutional Convention. I would say that most of the people in Chile really do not understand what a parliamentary system is. I mean, we've had 20, 200 years of a presidential system. I mean, what is a, a, a Moreover, one of the problems that will arise very soon if we finally end up with a parliamentary system is that people really don't know exactly what it is. I mean, when you ask people, would you like that the president is selected by Congress rather by, than by yourself? They could tell you, no, not at all. I, I want to elect the president. I don't want, I mean, the Congress has a very low approval rating. Uh, so I would rather choose, uh, choose uh, the, the president than, 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 uh, than having a you know, system where the Congress uh, chooses the prime minister in this case. Well, thank you very much. This has been an extremely stimulating conversation. Please join me in thanking Rodrigo Vergara uh, for a, a really wonderful event. Unfortunately, we've we reached the appointed hour. I know there were a lot more questions. Um, if you're amenable to staying around for just a few more minutes, some some students may want to come up to you and ask, ask a few additional questions, but thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. Thank you. For